Thank you. Good morning. Mandy was obviously an integral part of the preaching team, and I was constantly in awe of her knowledge of the Bible and her preaching ability and ultimately her love for Jesus. And as Keith said at the beginning, she was reading Jeremiah when Jesus called her home. And what would she have said to me this morning? She would have said, preach Jeremiah and preach Jesus. You know, what else are you going to do? So that is what I'm going to do today. I'm going to go ahead and and preach Jeremiah and feel very honored to do so. So we are well into our series in Jeremiah. Uh, And Mandy uh, preached the first Sunday about Jeremiah. And in fact, she made reference and she said that Graham is going to uh, preach on this topic later. So uh, here I am. Hopefully, we've already begun to learn a little bit about who Jeremiah was and about uh, this book in the Bible. Uh, This is the longest book in the Bible, as we've been told. And ultimately, if I were to summarize Jeremiah... We could boil it down to this, that Jeremiah was giving warnings, warnings uh, through that God was using Jeremiah to give these warnings to the people uh, to tell them to turn from their sin. Um, Otherwise, they would face the punishment, and the punishment would be exile. Uh, This exile would be the fact that enemies would come and overtake Judah, the land, and then send the people away to Babylon, uh, exile. And that did ultimately happen. And that was the the punishment that Jeremiah had foretold took place. And we see that within the book of Jeremiah and, of course, within other books of the Bible as well. But then ultimately, restoration. The promises that God, through Jeremiah, gave to tell the people that he would not turn away from them forever. And it might not be immediately, it was about 70 years, but that he would restore his nation and his people. And these promises of restoration uh, were given during the time uh, in exile to encourage the people to continue trusting in God even though they were in exile. Um, and also, there are promises of restoration even interwoven within the warnings as well. So God is basically saying, um, turn away from your sin. If you don't turn away from your sin, the punishment is exile, but I won't destroy you completely. I will restore you ultimately. So, as we know, Jeremiah was a prophet, someone that God used to give a message, God's message, to the people. And these messages were warnings, as I said, to turn away from wrongdoing and or promises of restoration. And Jeremiah certainly shouts out his message. He makes it abundantly clear what the message is, what will happen to God's people if they do not obey him. And one of the techniques that Jeremiah uses in order to convey this message is the use of pictures or imagery or visual aids. And that is, of course, what I'm going to pick up on today. I think it's true to say that most of us actually like pictures uh, because of a number of reasons. They're just aesthetically pleasing, uh, but often because they convey some sort of message to us. Uh, We put art on our walls because often there is a a particular meaning that a picture has for us. And we want to highlight that. We want to showcase it by putting that up on our walls in our house. Um, My wife, Kendra, loves the Christian artist Hannah Dunnett. And this is a piece of her work. It's entitled Great Delight. Um, So it's a, a Christian piece of art. Our daughter's middle name means great delight. And so this particular piece of art is very special to us um, as 
it was sort of around when our daughter was born, and uh, it, it shares the meaning of her middle name, as I say. And so it's up uh, in her bedroom as a reminder of her, but also as a reminder of God's great delight in sending Jesus to the earth. So this is an example of a special piece of art for us, and I'm sure you probably have the same in your house. And when we come to Jeremiah, we see that he's used uh, visual aids, pictures, imagery, props in his message to highlight or to showcase, to put on the walls, let's say, of the points that he wants to make. And we've heard in the Bible readings these five examples of certain props. And as Keith rightly predicted, if Jeremiah is going to use props, then I am definitely going to use props in my sermon today. And we'll go through each of those props uh, in a few moments. Uh, Here they are. But why is he using these pictures, these images, these props in the first place? Why? And I believe it's because God, through Jeremiah wants to highlight his message in a particular way in the hope that it resonates with his listeners because these are everyday objects that his listeners will be very, very familiar with. And so these images will resonate with the people there. And it's why I, when I come up here to talk to you, I like to use props as well. Um, Hopefully because they will resonate with you and that you will remember them at least maybe for a few days afterwards. Uh, Just to showcase some of them. Uh, Ten points if you can remember what the message was behind the props. But there we go. So that's why I'm doing it. I, I, I just want to try and make a connection with you. And often we are visual learners. And I do hope and I do pray that some of them do stick uh, with you uh, for at least a, a few days, if, if nothing else. And of course, I'm not the only preacher to do this, as we've seen with Jeremiah And as we see with Jesus himself, who uses uh, pictures, he used pictures when he was on the earth. He spoke using parables. And we're going to be looking at, uh, spoiler alert, we're going to be looking at parables next term. So let's briefly look at these five pictures that Jeremiah uses and the points that he's trying to make with them. So obviously, I've got a bag full of props here. Oops. So, first of all, can anyone remember the first one that was read to us? It is a linen belt. Right. Here we go. This is my belt. I don't know if it's linen, but it's linen. So, God tells Jeremiah to buy a linen belt and to put it round his waist. Now, why is he doing this? What does this mean? It does have some significance. The linen is representing priestly garments. So the local audience would immediately recognize that Jeremiah, when he was putting this on, was basically dressing himself up as a priest to denote himself as being holy. And the belt was tied around his waist, and it's tied tight, and that symbolizes the people being tied to God, being firmly uh, fixed to God. And maybe what you noticed uh, there in um, verse, I can't remember, Jeremiah 13, uh, verse, uh, and I put it around my waist, and he says, do not let it touch water, in verse 1, the end of verse 1. So, question for you. What happens if you buy some clothes and you do not wash the clothes in water? It becomes a bit stinky. Thanks. bit stinky, bit dirty. Okay, the teenagers have gone upstairs. They know well about this. I do with a teenage son as well. So, 
the holy clothes have become unholy because they haven't been washed. They've become sinful. They've become full of pride. And then God tells Jeremiah to take this linen belt, this stinky linen belt, and to hide it. Could you hide it, please? Thanks very much. To hide... Oh, right. Oh, yeah. You're doing a great job. Thanks, Pete. Right. Okay. So uh, God tells Jeremiah to hide the linen belt in some rocks, and he does that. And then days later, God tells Jeremiah to dig up the belt. Could you go and dig up the belt, please? Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. Which he does. Right. Now... Surprise, surprise, what's happened? So this dirty, stinky belt has been buried. And what happens to linen? What happens to cloth if you bury it for a while in soil? It begins to disintegrate. So now this linen belt is not only dirty and stinky, it's completely ruined and useless. So that's the picture that Jeremiah has built up for us. Uh, And God, through Jeremiah, is saying, well, this is a picture of my holy people. They were holy, they were tied tight to me, but now they've worshipped other gods. They've become proud and stubborn, and they're completely useless to me. So, the holy belt is a picture of holy people who are now completely useless. Right, so that's... Number one, we've got five of these to go, okay, just so you know where we are, right. Number two is wineskins. Now, right, wineskins. So in the past, people stored wine in wineskins. So a bit like the picture on the left there, that's sort of what what they looked like. Um, So the the skins of animals, and, and they sort of sewed it up, and if you put the wine in there, the wine would keep very well. It would stop the wine going off. Nowadays, we put it in a wine bottle. (laughs) Who would like to have the wine bottle? It doesn't represent anything at all, just that you're holding the wine bottle. That's all it represents. (laughs) Right. Okay. So, um, (laughs) So, God, through Jeremiah, gives this picture and says that wine naturally belongs in wineskins. It's an obvious point, but... Now, the people have become drunk on that wine. So God gives the picture that he is pouring out his wrath. Uh, and that's the picture. The cup of wine is pouring is God's wrath that will come out on the people. And it says in this passage, um, so Jeremiah 13, 12, and 13, and 14, uh, I will, uh, this is what the law says, I'm going to fill with drunkenness all who live in this land, all who live in this land, including the kings, so the highest people who sit on David's throne, the priests, the prophets, and all those living in Jerusalem. I will smash them one against the other. So from the most important, the kings, to the everyday person living in Jerusalem, they will all be smashed and destroyed by the wine of God's wrath. Later on in Jeremiah 25, 15, if you have a Bible, just flick to it uh, quickly. Jeremiah 25, 15, it says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, said to me. Take from my hand this cup filled with the wine of my wrath and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. When they drink it, they will stagger and go mad because of the sword I will send among them. So it is a picture of God's wrath, God's punishment, on his people because of their sin, because of their sinful pride. Okay, right, picture number three is the potter's clay. Hang on. Some clay. Right. So, in this picture, Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah goes to see the potter who was making something out of the wonderful clay, not Play-Doh. And the potter was making something, and when he wasn't particularly pleased with it, when he saw that it was a bit rubbish and useless, what did he do? He simply squashed it up, because he could. And then he started making something new out of it. 
Okay, who would like Effie? Would you like the play? The clay, the clay, the clay. Uh, right, so, uh, so God says, Oh, house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter does? God warns of the punishment, of the ruin that will happen. Can you squish it together? There we go, that's the ruin happening. But also the opportunity for the people to repent. And in which case, God will choose to relent and that disaster will not happen. God is sovereign. He, is, he isn't choosing his, he isn't changing his mind, but he is allowing the people the choice. Do they want to go their own way? That leads to ruin. Can you squash the clay again? Thanks. Or will they choose to repent, live as God commands, and then be shaped into one, something that's really wonderful. Can you shape it into something that's really wonderful? <laughs> Excellent. Good. Thanks very much. So, that's the potter's clay. That God can shape, mould his people as he sees fit. But the question then for God's people, do they want to be shaped by him? Or are they going to be ruined and useless and be destroyed by him? So the people had a choice, but then God can shape as he sees fit. Now, the next one. Jeremiah visits the potter again. This time, we have a, the pot, possibly the pot that he made. A clay jar is bought by Jeremiah. And this isn't the pliable clay that we saw in the last picture, but it's hardened clay now. It's been fired. It's hard. And this is a picture that God's people have now, as it says in Jeremiah 19, forsaken me, God, and made this a place of foreign gods. So God's people have gone away from him. They have hardened themselves. So God tells Jeremiah to break the jar and to smash it on the ground. I'm not going to do that because I would get into some trouble. Um, but maybe, Sharon, if you can have that, and if you can and pretend it's smashed, but don't actually smash it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Good. So this, the picture of the smash jar, represents what the Lord Almighty says. I will smash this nation, Judah, and this city, Jerusalem, just as this potter's jar is smashed and cannot be repaired. So through this picture, Jeremiah is saying, well, enough of the warnings, the disaster, the punishment, that was prophesied is now going to happen to God's people. They will be destroyed. So the smash jar represents the disaster that comes on God's people because of their sin and their stubbornness and their refusal to turn away from the sin and turn back to God. And our final picture uh, for today, uh, and it's one that Jeremiah spoke about when that disaster happened, when the people were taken into exile. And it's a picture of figs. Now, figs were a common fruit in those days. Now, Kendra and I spent a long time in many supermarkets trying to find figs, and then so much has happened this week, so unfortunately, we did not end up with figs. But figs, uh, well, we didn't give a fig about the figs. Um, figs, as I said, were a common fruit in those days at that time, so I have a common fruit, apples, okay, that's going to represent the figs. Um, so... God shows Jeremiah two baskets of figs. One basket has good, ripe, tasty figs, and the other basket has bad, poor quality, slightly moldy ones. Sarah, would you like some figs? Can you, can you see that this apple is rather nice and this apple is not that nice, is it? Yeah. So we have... Uh, Good figs, or good apples, and bad figs, bad apples. And the picture is the good figs, those people who were in exile, uh, but were, were 
looking to God. We're trying to uh, serve God, even though they're in exile. People like Daniel and his contemporaries. These people will indeed be watched over by God, and God will restore them. God will bring them back to Jerusalem. And that did indeed happen, if you read the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And God says, well, I will build these people up. I will build this nation back up. I will not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their heart. But the bad figs, the bad apples, the bad fruit, well, those are people who make that decision not to return to God. They will be banished and ultimately destroyed. So that's the picture of the figs. So that's all well and lovely for the people in, uh, at that time. But what does it have to do with us here and now? Well, as hopefully you're being reminded that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, as 2 Timothy says. And all Scripture points to Jesus. And indeed, the warnings... And the promises of restoration that Jeremiah gave back then are, I believe, useful to us now because they point to Jesus. And this is the basis of our Christian hope, the foundation of our gospel, our, of our good news, that, yes, we sin, yes, we turn away from God, and there are warnings to us to, to turn away from our sin. And the... The fact that if we don't turn away from our sin, there is exile. There is exile away from God. But there is also that promise of restoration that God promises through Jesus to bring us back to him uh, now and in our eternal life. So let's quickly go through our five pictures again. And what I want to do is to show how those five pictures are important for us now in the light of Jesus. Let's take our linen belt again. Oop. Right. We are sinful and unholy and useless like the buried linen belt. Now, linen represents the holy priest, remember. And it was Jesus is our holy priest. Hebrews tells us that Jesus we acknowledge as our apostle and our high priest. And then, like the linen belt that was buried in the ground, Jesus died and he was buried. And like the belt, he was placed in linen. So Joseph of Arimathea bought some linen cloth, took Jesus' body down from the cross, wrapped Jesus in the linen, and placed it in a tomb cut out of the rock. Isn't that similar to the story of the linen belt? And Jesus died and was buried because he had become dirty and stinky and un unholy, because of our sin, in place of us. The wineskins. Who's got the wine bottle? Naomi. We, too, should be subject to God's wrath, God's punishment, the pouring out of God's fury, Revelation 14 says, drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. But Jesus is the one who took that wine of punishment, the wine of wrath, and Jesus poured it out. You remember in the Last Supper, Jesus took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. That picture of wine, again, in communion, when we take communion, that's a picture of the wine signifying Jesus' blood poured out for us. And the people in Jeremiah's day had to suffer their own consequences for their own sin. But because of Jesus' blood, we don't have to suffer those consequences. Jesus has died for us. 
Let's have a look at the potter's clay. Who's got the clay? Thank you. That is magnificent. Thank you very much. And this still rings true. So in Romans uh, 9, we read that we are made by God. So what is formed, say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter, that's God, have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? So God can still shape us as he sees fit, according to his will, according to God's purposes for us. And the question, like to the people of Jeremiah's day, is are we going to be obedient to be shaped according to God's will? Jesus was, and ultimately that led him to death. Just before Jesus died, he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. God shaped Jesus into the purpose that he had for him, that Jesus would die in our place. The next one is the smashed jar. Who's got the jar? Where did I put it? Sharon. Okay. So the jar, the hardened jar that was smashed ultimately. And again, it's a picture of Jesus. But he, Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed. He was smashed. He was destroyed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So Jesus took the disaster on him, himself, instead of us. Which means that our jars are still intact. They're not crushed. They're not destroyed. In 2 Corinthians, we read, God made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are not smashed on the ground because Jesus was. And then finally, the picture of the figs. Thank you, Sarah. Oh, you're going to throw them to me. <laughs> so, the good fig, the good apple, the good fruit, or the bad figs. And that picture is still relevant for us today. And the call for us to decide, are we going to be a good fig or a bad fig? To remind you what Jeremiah said, the promise for those who chose to be a good piece of fruit. My eyes will watch over them for their good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not uproot them. I will give them a heart to know me that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their hearts. So a good fig is one who will return to God with all their heart. So when you sin... That happens, but will you return to God with all your heart? And therefore, God will watch over you. God will build you up. And God will cause you to have a heart to know God further. Jesus gave the parable of the fig tree. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now, it's a long time, I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? So again, the warning of destruction. Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig round it and fertilize it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. And if not, then cut it down. So here, Jesus also uses the picture of fruits, figs, fruit tree, fig tree, again as a warning to repent, to turn away. And ultimately, again, we have that choice. Are we going to 
be a good fig or a bad fig. I just find the Bible amazing. Like Mandy kept, kept telling me about how she had read some passage and how amazing she had found it. And I find that too, that the warnings and the promises that Jeremiah announced to the people in those days also point to Jesus. We see the same pictures coming up again and again throughout the Bible. And those pictures point to the absolute importance of Jesus. It points to God's grace and mercy on us through Jesus. So we have the question today, you know, do we take hold of that in our everyday lives? When we sin, when we mess up, do we then say, oh, okay, all right, I come back to you, Jesus. So ultimately, in conclusion, these, these pictures, these props, these visual aids that Jeremiah used are for us too. Warnings to turn away from sin. A reminder that it's true that there is an exile away from God that could happen as a result of our sin. But the restoration that God promises through Jesus, if we choose it, new life with him in this life and in our eternal life. It's what Mandy chose. Let's pray.